Next up, we have Ben Herb from the, uh, the director of Bright New, uh, Bright New World, uh, looking to, to building a world with stable climate and a prosperous human civilization. Uh, so uh, Ben will, will talk to, uh, tell us something about why, what, what are the challenges in, in, in building this world just with renewables. Okay, go ahead. Thank you very much, Ada. Good. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very, very much for having me. Uh, for a few reasons, honestly, it's a real honour to join this workshop with this theme, and I echo uh, the remarks. I, I, I echo the remarks from before that uh, I think Rowley's idea was inspired. Um, and secondly, it's my first visit to Finland, and thank you very much to World Energy Council, uh, who sponsored my travel here today. Uh, I'd like to speak with you about this challenge of deep decarbonisation, and in particular, I would like to focus on um, interrogating the idea that this is something that can be dealt with only using renewable technologies. And that is an idea that we, uh, which is myself and my um, thesis supervisors, interrogated uh, to publish a paper called Burden of Proof, which was published last year uh, and went on to be one of the most highly shared papers of the year, I'm pleased to say. Uh, from that journal. Uh, so clearly a lot of people are wanting to have a framework to understand what can renewable technologies offer this problem and what are the limitations. And that is not a matter of being supportive or not supportive of the use of technologies. It's a matter of being realistic and pragmatic about what some technologies can do, what they can't do, what their limitations are. And unless we can acquaint ourselves in a realistic way with those issues, we will only delay the pursuit of actual action and delivery of solutions that will work. In brief, just echoing um, some of Kirsty's remarks as well, this was a, is a chart that is in the, uh, the introduction for, for my thesis. And I just have to point out that the first IPCC report was 1990. It's now 2017, we've had nearly three decades of increasing investigation, consideration, awareness and concern about climate change. And the only appreciable way that our energy mix and use has changed is that it has grown. That is the only thing that has changed, with the exception of, in the last 10 years in particular, yes, quite a large uptick in the use of renewable technologies to generate electricity. That is the only sign of any form of meaningful transition. And the amount that the renewable technologies grew with the amount of electricity that they now produce was less than the growth in electricity from fossil fuels alone. Just, just less than, it was about the same. So everything that we have achieved in terms of clean energy in those three decades has not even been enough to offset just the growth in fossil fuel electricity. In terms of overall electricity, Everything has simply grown. Coal, oil, gas, total primary energy, and emissions. So we, it's a little sobering, but it's important to note, we are not yet on a clean energy transition pathway at all. And that's why this event is so important, because there is so much more at stake here than just electricity. Now, I just want to look at electricity for a while, because that is largely a focus, and so we ran an investigation where we reviewed 25 100% renewable electricity studies and we created a framework of four criteria to determine were the studies providing a strong basis of evidence that 100% renewables could operate. Now, it's challenging because renewables is an umbrella term and it captures technologies that are wildly different, in fact. I mean, there is really nothing in common between a small solar photovoltaic system on a rooftop in Adelaide and a massive hydroelectric facility here in Scandinavia. And yet they're both called renewables. So we must be very careful with that term and what people take into account. There's really no question that if you have enough hydroelectric capacity, sure, you can run a country on that. That's established. And that isn't what most people are talking about when they're saying we can do it all with renewables. They mainly mean wind and solar power with some contribution from ocean-based technologies or perhaps geothermal. That is generally what people are talking about. So we wanted to know whether or not 
They were looking at demand scenarios that were reasonable. We wanted to know whether they were actually checking whether the supply could meet the demand in those sort of time frame increments. Because creating the quantity of electricity has never been a challenge. Getting the electricity supply to meet the demand, that is the challenge in real time. We wanted to know whether or not they had thought about how they're going to move the electricity from one place to another, which is very difficult. And finally, we wanted to know that they were going to actually maintain the stability of the system via ancillary services, controlling the frequency pr properly, which is essential. And I may be overstating the impact of the paper, but I strongly suggest that many of these authors didn't even understand what frequency control was until they had read our critique, because nearly none of them um, considered it. Briefly, what we found was some good studies. We found many good studies, um, many incomplete studies, and some exceptionally poor studies. I'll highlight some of the trends that were through this literature that are very important to know. First of all, the, the demand forecasts were, in many cases, utterly unrealistic. And so what was happening is authors were beginning by creating a scenario of energy demand to suit their solutions that they wanted to be able to then deploy. Now that's okay on paper, that's a nice modelling scientific exercise, but what if the world you end up with isn't that one you designed? How robust are your solutions to the world that might happen? And so when we saw things like this, where this is projected primary energy demand by three different modelling efforts, uh, four different modelling efforts, World Energy Technology Organisation, IPCC, and you can see that the median is heading towards about 800 uh, petajoules, uh, exajoules per year, sorry, and there's a big cluster here between sort of 600 to 900, 1,000 exajoules per year, a few outliers high, a couple of outliers low, and Greenpeace and the WWF begin by assuming that global primary energy will be here and here, and then craft a 100% renewable solution and say, look, the world can run on 100% renewables. For me, that's a form of lying. And it's a very dangerous form of lying because it's giving us a very false idea about what we can do and where the world is likely to go. This was not restricted to those two organisations. This contraction in primary energy was really widespread across the studies. This Australian study assumed we would cut primary energy, primary energy consumption by nearly 60%. And you can see that it was um, also in the UK, the Denmark study, New York State, Macedonia, this other Australian study, uh, Irish study as well, European Union. Now, in some specific jurisdictions, like perhaps here in Finland and also in Australia, we have a relatively mature amount of per capita energy consumption. We can't consume too much more energy. <laughs> We're kind of saturated. Okay, fair enough. And so possibly in future, in some jurisdictions, you might actually see uh, energy consumption per capita reduce a little bit. That's fine. But these projections were way outside of historical precedent. And therefore, their solutions are not robust. So we end up pursuing a solution set that is almost inevitably going to fail. And that's really very risky. Many of the um, scenarios did not do modelling to actually ensure that supply was going to meet demand. Now here's one effort that did from Australia and, and you can see just how challenging it becomes. Where ordinarily we would run a baseload provider at about this level, which in Australia is predominantly coal and gas. We have one of the dirtiest electricity supplies in the world but it could be nuclear power, uh, as per some of the uh, countries here in Europe, and then some peaking supply. Well, here, we're needing to combine a wind supply, which is wildly fluctuating, solar thermal and solar PV with storage so that it can move over to match the peaks, and here we have an enormous backup sector of biomass, which is absolutely crucial in some weeks and completely idle in other weeks. And this is in the Australian setting where we have a very good renewable resource compared to our population. This is very difficult, and this was only done to a one hour resolution, as opposed to 15 minute, half hour, five minute, and renewable energy can fluctuate on those time frames, and does. Many, many, many of the studies when they said renewable meant absolutely maximizing hydroelectricity use. Now in some settings, that's already the case, in some settings that can be okay. In many of the settings they're talking about, they're talking about virgin rivers. So they're talking about developments like this on frontier Amazon rainforest territory. Thousands of kilometres away from the major cities of Brazil, thousands of kilometres away from the energy consumption. 
these sorts of developments are going to flood, in this case, 95 square kilometres of river valley in the Amazon will be flooded in the name of clean energy. So if we pursue hydroelectricity in frontier places like South America, like Africa, what we're doing is destroying the very natural assets that we're supposed to be protecting by managing climate change. And you really have to ask yourself, why are we doing that? When we could get equivalent energy, and in fact do get equivalent energy, on 1.4 square kilometres, just 100 kilometres away from Buenos Aires, in an area that's already farmland. So this gets back to something that Kirsty is saying, where we need to think, in terms of efficiency, we also need to think in terms of efficiency of energy production itself, not just efficiency of energy use, but efficiency in the way we use land to make energy. Because those are the values that we're meant to be trying to protect. And just to give you some idea, that is where the Teles Pires Dam is being constructed. And it's indigenous territory for South American native peoples. And this is where most of Brazil lives. Whereas by contrast, there is Buenos Aires and there is the nuclear power station. It, it is, I think, far more moral for those of us who live in cities to accept a nuclear power station close to where we use the energy and take responsibility for those impacts. And finally, there was also huge dependence on biomass. Really to get that reliability where people didn't have enough wind and solar resource, the ex expectation of using biomass was enormous, such as in the Irish study where they presumed up to 80% plus of primary energy would be biomass. The consequences of biomass at this scale are staggering. It's enormous increased land consumption, precisely in the century where we cannot afford that if we want more wilderness in our world. And so again, we need to realise that when we are looking to address climate change, we cannot sacrifice every other sustainability value along the way. We actually need to bring these things together. We can't industrialise every landscape in the pursuit of clean energy. That, for me, is defeating the purpose of being an environmentalist. And just quickly, in terms of efficiency and in terms of energy consumption, yes, we want to be efficient, but if we want to close materials loops, we need energy. Recycling is incredibly energy-intensive business. If we want to get more value out of ore from the ground, if energy is cheap and clean, we can get more value out of that ore and do less mining. So always thinking in terms of only using less energy, sometimes we actually need to use more energy because it can substitute for other natural services. And that's something that I think today is going to be very, very interesting in terms of how can we substitute for synthetic fuels? How can we... Uh, how can we substitute for fossil liquid fuels? How can we substitute for heat and remove impacts from here by intensifying with energy? If the energy is clean and it's affordable, we can do that, we can make a better world. Because these resources don't recycle themselves. That's energy. So we need to pursue a pathway where we can make that, that energy plentiful and clean, and then we can, as well as reducing greenhouse gas emissions, also improve our sustainability on a whole range of fronts. I'll leave it at that. I'll look forward to your questions. Um, but thank you again very much for having me. Thank you, Ben, for, the, for the, another eye-opening talk. Uh, now we've heard... Uh, any questions for, for Ben at this moment? If not, we can continue on. So we have heard from the two NGOs uh, some concerning words about the state of the world. 